Today we mark the 11th of November, Armistice, the end of the war. It's important to remember, we will remember them. And in doing that, I wanted to read out some of the recollections from the soldiers. That's what we're going to do, hey? So this is the book, Forgotten Voices of the Great War. A new history of World War One and the words of the men and women who were there. Private William Dove, 16th Lancers. War had been declared, and the following Sunday I went with a friend of mine to Shepherd's Bush Empire to see the film show. At the end they showed the fleet sailing the high seas and played Britons shall never be slaves and hearts of oak. And you know how one feels that little shiver run up the back and you know you have to do something. I had just turned 17 and at that time and on the Monday I went up to Whitehall, Old Scotland Yard and enlisted in the 16th Lancers. This is a recollection by Elizabeth Owen. I was seven and I was playing in the garden when I was asked to go and speak to my grandmother. She said, now children, I've got something very serious to tell you. The Germans are fighting the British. There is a war on and all sorts of people will be killed by these wicked Germans. And therefore there must be no playing, no singing and no running about. And then she took from us all of our toys that were made in Germany. Amongst them, a camel of which I was very fond. Then we heard that the khaki men were coming to take away all the horses from the village. Everything in the village was done by horses. The station was about a mile or a mile and a half way and the train was met by a brake drawn by horses. The milk was delivered by horses and the milk used to be collected from the farms and brought in by the horses to the butter market. There was a farmer who had a lovely pair who we called the Prancers. He thought he would try and hide these horses but the khaki men found them. They tied them all together on a long rope. I think there was about 20. All horses we used to know and love and feed. Then they started trotting them out of the village and as they went out of sight, we were all terribly sad. Sergeant Stefan Westman, 29th Division, German Army. During our advance through Belgium, we marched on and on. We never dared take off our boots because our feet were so swollen that we didn't think it would be possible to put them back on again. In one small village, the mayor came and asked our company commanders not to allow us to cut off the hands of children. These were trusty stories which he had heard about the German army. At first, we laughed about it, but when we heard of other propaganda things said against the German army, we became angry. Rifleman Henry Williamson, London Rifle Brigade. During our training in Crowborough in Sussex, it was a month of great heat. We sweated tremendously. We carried about 60 pounds of ammunition, kit and our rifle. We got blisters, but we did about 15 or 16 miles a day with 10 minutes halt every hour. We lay on our backs gasping. Water bottles were drunk dry, people in cottages, women in sun bonnets came up with apples and jugs of water and we passed some of the battalions who had been in front of us whose headquarters were in some of the poorer quarters of London and I remember so well the dead white faces, many with boils lying completely exhausted, sun stricken in the hedges, hundreds of them. Private Frank Sumter London Rifle Brigade. After the 19th December attack, we were back in the same trenches when Christmas Day came along. It was a terrible winter, everything was covered in snow, everything was white. The devastated landscape looked terrible in its true colours, clay and mud and broken brick, but when it was covered in snow, it was beautiful. Then we heard the Germans singing, Silent Night, Holy Night, and they put up a notice saying, Merry Christmas, so we put one up too. Private Thomas Mickendo, 12th Battalion, Middlesex Regiment. 
Rats! Oh crikey! If they were put in a harness, they could have done a milk round. They were that big, yes, honest. Nearly every morning a bloody great thing would come up and stand on its back legs and gnaw at something. I used to line the sights up and give them one round of ball. Bang! And blow them to nothing. Private Charles Taylor, 13th Battalion, Yorks and Lanks. I started crawling towards our lines. I had never seen so many dead men clumped together. That was all I could see, and I thought to myself, all the world's dead. They're all dead. They're all dead. That's all I could think as I crawled along. Everywhere I passed, to my left and my right, were dead men laying on the ground. Private S.T. Sherwood As I slipped to the bottom of the shell hole, I took my torch out, flashed it around, and to my horror, I had a German companion. That was when the terrific stink came from. I thought, heavens, am I going to be spending the night with you? I knew that without help, it was impossible to get out. So I shouted, screamed, and did everything possible to make someone hear me. I shone my torch up in the air in the hope that someone would see the light, but nothing happened. I wasn't one to panic. I was always one to keep cool if possible, but for the next half hour I struggled as hard as I could to climb up the sides, and in the process my trench boots were left at the bottom. But every time I would get within a yard at the top, I'd slide back into this terrible filth again. I reviewed my position and realised I'd have to keep myself going until the morning. First, I decided to sing and sang all the songs I could possibly think of. I sang, I cursed, I raved and eventually I prayed. I prayed that help would come before morning. I was sweating from head to foot with all the exertion. Then, as I lay back in the trench, I remembered my old pipe and tobacco and smoked pipe after pipe. Gradually, I found I was sinking further and further into this mire. The water had gone above my waist and no matter how I struggled, it was impossible to get out. I knew that struggling further wasn't going to help me, so I continued smoking and singing and shouting as best as I could until my voice had almost gone. I took my rifle and jammed into the side of the shell hole as far as I could to give me some support, putting my right arm through the sling. Then I either dozed off or became unconscious. I don't know which, because when I woke the bottom of my body was absolutely paralysed by the coldness of the water, which I could feel creeping further and further up. During this period, the Germans commenced shelling this area. The vibrations made the shell hole shake from one side to the other. I was rather pleased because it gave me something to find interest in. It kept me awake and alive. I was still sinking further and further into the mire. I filled my pipe again and then put my hand into my tunic pocket for my matches and found they were wet through. It was then I began to despair. I thought I would sooner be killed with a shell or a bullet than to die in a bloody, filthy shell hole. From then on, I can remember no more until I thought, can I be dreaming? There are footsteps somewhere. Feebly, I tried to shout until I heard a voice say, where are you? I shouted, I'm here, in a shell hole. The footsteps went round again for a few minutes, then looking up, I saw a head appear over the top. Oh my God, he said. Hang on, hang on, chum. I remembered no more from that hang on until I found myself in hospital between clean white sheets. 1916, Gunnar George Cole, 3rd Northumbrian Brigade, Royal Field Artillery. I can remember going past the church in Albert with the Madonna. There was a legend that on the day that the Madonna fell, the war would be over. I was a bit of a comic like, so I said, let's knock it down now and the war will finish. 
Captain George Jameson, Battalion, 1st Northumberland Hussars. I hung my thresher and glenny coat up on the door. Later on, the weather turned freezing and the ground became iron hard. I didn't see that coat for three weeks. And when I came back for it, it was so frozen that it broke into pieces. Fusilier Harold Pilling, 1-6 Lancashire Fusiliers. If you'd looked into the latrines, you would have been sickened. You would have thought people had parted with their stomachs or their insides. It was awful. You had to cover it up and just dig another. It hadn't to be too high, else you'd fall down. There were no supports or anything, it was just an open trench, but it was fairly deep. Ordinary Seaman Joe Murray, Hood Battalion, Royal Navy Division. Dysentery was a truly awful disease that could rob a man of the last vestiges of human dignity before it killed him. A couple of weeks before getting it, my old pal was as smart and upright as a guardsman. Yet after about 10 days, it was dreadful to see him crawling about, his trousers around his feet, his backside hanging out, his shirt all soiled. Everything was soiled. He couldn't even walk. And so I took him by one arm and another pal got hold of him by the other and we dragged him to the latrine. It was degrading when you remember how he just was a while ago. Neither my other pal or I were very good, but we weren't like that. Anyway, we lowered him down next to the latrine. We tried to keep the flies off him and to turn him around, put his backside towards the trench. But he simply rolled into this foot wide trench, half sideways, head first in the slime. We couldn't pull him out. We didn't have enough strength and he couldn't help himself at all. We did eventually get him out, but he was dead. He'd drowned in his own excrement. Corporal Clifford Lane, 1st Battalion, Hertfordshire Regiment. We were so thirsty that we actually drank out of the shell holes and God knows what a shell hole contains. It could hold anything, very often parts of a human body, but we were so thirsty we drank it cold without burning it because you couldn't get a fire very often. Mrs. Scott Hartley, Voluntary Aid Detachment. I was working as a VAD in a hospital in Bullstroll Street in West London. It was a big house taken over by the authorities and all the cases were shell-shocked, which meant they couldn't keep their heads or their hands still. I had to hold them gently behind their heads and feed them and I also had to write their love letters. Many couldn't say what they wanted to say or they were probably too shy to tell me. But I used to write for them and let them read them back. I used to say, my dearest darling, you know, and forever yours. 1918, Armistice. Marine Hubert Trotman, Royal Marine Light Infantry. As we advanced on the village, a runner came up and told us that the Armistice would be signed at 11 o'clock that day, the 11th of November. That was the first that we knew of it. We were lined up on a railway bank nearby, the same railway bank that the Manchesters had lined up on in 1914. They fought at the Battle of Mons in August that year. Some of us went down to a wood in a little valley and found the skeletons of some of the Manchesters still lying there. Lying there with their boots on, very still, no helmets, no rusty rifles or equipment, just their boots. Major Keith Officer, Australian Corps. At 11 o'clock on the 11th of November, I was sitting in the room in the Brewer's house at Le Cateau, which had been Sir John French's headquarters at the time of the Battle of the Mons. I was sitting at a table with a major in the Scots Greys who had a large old-fashioned hunting watch which he put down on the table and watched the minutes going round. When 11 o'clock came, he shut up his watch and said, I wonder what we're all going to do next. 
That was very much the feeling of everyone. What was one going to do next? To some of us, it was the end of four years. To others, three years. To some, less. For many of us, it was practically the only life we had known. We'd started so young. Nearby, there was a German machine gun unit giving our troops a lot of trouble. They kept on firing until practically 11 o'clock. At precisely 11 o'clock, an officer stepped out of their position, stood up, lifted his helmet and bowed to the British troops. He then fell in with all of his men in the front of the trench and marched them off. I always thought that there was this wonderful display of confidence in British chivalry because the temptation to fire on them must have been very great. Corporal Reginald Leonard Hayne, 1st Battalion, Honourable Artillery Company. It wasn't like London, where they all got drunk of course. No, it wasn't like that. It was all very quiet. You were so dazed that you didn't realise you could stand up straight and not be shot. Corporal Clifford Lane, 1st Battalion, Hertfordshire Regiment. As far as the armistice was concerned, it was kind of an anticlimax. We were too far gone, too exhausted really, to enjoy it. All we wanted to do was go back to our billets. There was no cheering, no singing, and that day we had no alcohol at all. We simply celebrated the armistice in silence and in thankfulness that it was all over. And I believe that happened quite a lot in France. It was such a sense of anticlimax. We were drained of all emotion. That's what it amounted to. Sergeant Major Richard Tobin, Hood Battalion, Royal Naval Division. The armistice came the day we dreamed of. The gun stopped, the firing stopped. Four years of noise and bangs ended in silence. The killings had stopped. We were stunned. I'd been out since 1914. I should have been happy. I was sad. I thought of the slaughter, and the hardship, the waste, and the friends I had lost. I hope you've enjoyed this mini extract of The Forgotten Voices of the Great War by Max Arthur. It's a fantastic book and it actually puts a lot of things in life into perspective. And I know it sounds very strange, but this is my go-to book if I'm ever struggling. One of the things I wanted to do whilst living on this narrowboat was to film exactly what I wanted to film. This boat is nearly 100 years old. 1928. There were men on this boat that had seen the aftermath of the First World War, had family members and friends who were in the First World War, had seen the Great Depression that happened as a result. A generation completely wiped from the world, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to read this. I hope you've enjoyed this little extract and this is just a little reminder for you to give yourself some love, hug someone you love, tell someone how you feel about them, how much you appreciate them and take a little moment as well to appreciate yourself. And if you have five minutes, make yourself a cup of tea as well because you deserve that. The night.